Howdy folks, it's Professor Ryan and um, here's what we're going to do in this uh, at the beginning of this lesson. Here's another kind of a warm-up exercise for you and as you can see we have another coordinate plane uh, only instead of an XY coordinate plane it is a P and Q coordinate plane where we have Q on the horizontal axis and we have P on the vertical axis. And I want to remind you that P is the price of the product that's being sold. Q is the quantity that is being sold. And what I want you to do here in this exercise is you can see that the price is going up by $3 at a time. So this is three, this is six, this is nine, 12, 15, etc. And the on the quantity axis, we're going up by 10 at a time. So this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, etc. Okay. And what I'd like you to do is I'm going to identify a point and I want you to identify the price and the quantity at that point. So how about, let's start with an easy one. Start right over here. What is the price and the quantity of this, this line right here? We're looking at this blue line, but that point in particular. Uh, all we have to do is go over to the horizontal line or, or the vertical line along the horizontal axis, which is 20. And if we were to go up to the point, to the line right there, uh, the price at that point is $27. So. Uh, on this uh, on this line right here, uh, we have a quantity of 20 with a price of $27. Okay, all right. How about this point right over here? At that point, let's see. We're going to go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. So quantity of 60 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But times 3, so that's 21. So this point represents a quantity of 60 uh, units for a price of $21. Now remember from the exercise that we did the other day that um, you could actually multiply the price times the quantity and get the total revenue for the business, right? Um, okay, let's go over to this red uh, line right here. And uh, what about this point right here? What would the price and quantity be at that point right there, okay? All right, I hope maybe you can pause the video and, and figure it out. Okay, so if we go along here, we got 10, 20, 30, here's 70, then 80, 90. At this one, that's 100. And then if we go up to the point, go over and look at the price, the price is 27. So that's the same price as this point over here, but it's a different quantity. On this one, we have a quantity of 100 for a price of $27. So note that even though this point has the same price as this point, they have different quantities because the, the points are in different places horizontally even though they're in the same place vertically. All right, here's what I'd like you to do next is um, let's look at this uh, green curve right here. It's not a straight line, it's a curve. Can you tell me uh, along this curve, what is the price and the quantity at this point right here? And I know you're thinking, you're like, uh, Professor Ryan, this seems like you're acting like I'm in like seventh grade or something. I know, but I, I need to start somewhere. I need to start with your knowledge somewhere to, to, to then bring you into this, um, the understanding of uh, microeconomics or macroeconomics. Um, and so that point right there, we've got 10, 20, quantity is 20, but the price is between 9 and 15. That's 12 right there. So we have a quantity of 20 and a price of $12. Now, uh, interestingly, now this point right here is very similar to this point up here. They both have a quantity of 20, but they have different prices. This is a quantity of 20 at a price of 12, where this one is a quantity of 20 at a price of 27. So even though they have the same quantity, they do not have the same price, okay? Uh, I'm gonna ask you uh, three more questions here. Can you tell me the price and the quantity where the red line and the blue line intersect, where they have, where they meet at the same place. Okay, why don't you pause the video and look at it for a minute, see if you can figure out the price and the quantity on that. All right, so this is the point here where the red and the blue intersect. At this point, they are they are in the exact same place. Now, I, I want to point something out about that point, about that intersection point, where those two lines intersect the blue and the red lines have the same quantity and the same price. Their prices are equal and their quantities are equal because they're sharing the same point on the coordinate plane. And so 
at this point, both red and blue have a quantity of 80 and a price of, it looks like, 18 $18. Okay? And so that point represents a quantity of 80 and a price of 18 Now, when we talked about these two points right here, this one and this one, blue and red, they had the same price, but they didn't have the same quantity. Then when we talked about this green and this blue here, they had the same quantity, but they didn't have the same price. But this point is very special because at this point, the, the blue and the red graph have the exact same quantity and the exact same price. So they agree, the two graphs, or the two, yeah, the, the two lines agree on quantity and they agree on price, right where they intersect. All right, could you now tell me, you know, let's just do one more. Can you find where the green and the red intersect and identify the quantity and the price? All right, you can see here's the green and here's the red, and so they cross over each other right here at this point. And so if we were to look at the quantity, the quantity here is going to be 60. And then, let's see here, quantity is 60. And then the price is over here is $9. So here's a point, this quantity of 60 and price of 9, uh, is a point where both the green curve and the red curve agree that they have the exact same quantity and the exact same price uh, um, at that point, okay? All right, well, this exercise hopefully uh, has gotten your brain ready for what I'm about to explain to you about markets. And what we're gonna talk about in this video is we're gonna begin uh, a discussion about the infamous concepts of economics called supply and demand. Uh, there are so many things in there are so many things in economics that refer to the dynamics of supply and demand, uh, so it's essential that you understand this. And we're going to go over supply and demand and all the intricacies of supply and demand over the course of the next few videos. Okay? Um, so if you don't quite understand, you could either watch the video again or go find some other videos out there. I promise you there are thousands of videos on the internet that are talking about supply and demand and you can find just the right one that helps you to understand these concepts. Uh, what I wanna start with is I wanna, I wanna draw a part of the uh, circular flow diagram. Um, and so I'm gonna write, I'm gonna put households over here, which we know are individuals or groups of individuals. We're gonna call them consumers. All right, so we have consumers over here, and then over here we have uh, firms, right? Okay, uh, and we're not going to get into the mess right now of business to business or business to consumer firms. So let's just let's just for now call them firms, okay? And those are the businesses, okay? And so we know that firms produce products for uh, uh, for consumers and that consumers buy those products. So firms produce products and they sell those products, right? So they sell their products to consumers and consumers buy those products. Now, we have already said in the video on the, uh, on the circular flow diagram that uh, households then pay money to firms, right? They pay money for the product. So money goes to the business, the product goes to the consumer, right? And we said that the money that the firms earn is their revenue or their total revenue, which is price times quantity, okay? Uh, but here's what I, it's important for you to understand is that uh, the firms are receiving the money and the households are paying out the money. So the exact same amount of money is leaving the consumer and going to the business. And it's important to understand that there's two decisions being made here simultaneously. One decision is being made by the consumers, the other decision is being made by the business. The consumer is making the decision to buy and the firm is making the decision to sell. And it is happening at the same time. Money is going one direction, the product is going the other direction. If either the buyer or the seller says no, then the whole thing is off. If the buyer says yes and the business, the seller says no, the buyer doesn't get it. They don't get that stuff even though they want to buy it. 
because it has to be two decisions of agreement. And that's the key. Two decisions of agreement. Both the buyer and the seller have to agree on two things. They have to agree on the price and they have to agree on the quantity. So, how much the firm is selling has to be equal to how much the buyer is buying. And how much the seller is selling it for has to be the same as what the buyer is buying it for. So the seller has to have the same price and quantity as the buyer. And this is a very, very important concept. If either one of them does not agree on the price or the quantity, the sale is off and we do not have a market transaction. Okay? So that's the first thing. I want you to keep that in mind while we talk about supply and demand. Okay? So in order for a person to agree to something, in order for a person to agree to something, they have to meet two criteria. In order to agree, they have to be willing to agree. And in order to agree, they have to be able to agree. Okay, so I may talk with a friend and we may both agree that I'm going to jump off a cliff and fly, but because I am not able to fly, that is not a fair agreement. We, are, we would both be wrong in that case. Uh, my friend is trying to trick me into killing myself and I don't know very much about physics and my capabilities as a human being. Uh, so, uh, so in order to agree, both parties have to be willing and able to do what they're going to do. Okay, well, what is the seller, what is the business willing and able to do? Well, they're willing and able to sell. They are willing to sell and they are able to sell. All right. If they are neither, let's say they're willing to sell, but they're not able to sell, well, then they're not going to sell because they're not able to sell the thing that they want to sell. Uh, what if they're able to sell a product, but they're not willing to? Ah, we don't want to sell that to you. Okay, well, then they're not going to sell it. So they have to be willing and able to sell. Similarly, a, uh, a consumer has to be willing and able to buy. Willing to buy, you know, I, I have to want the cheeseburger before I'll buy the cheeseburger. I have to be willing to buy the cheeseburger and then I have to be able to buy the cheeseburger. You know, if I walk into a Burger King uh, and I say, yeah, I'll take, you know, a Whopper, a large fry and a large Coke and they say, well, that's going to be $7 and I say, oh, well, I don't have any money. And they say, well, you're not able to buy this stuff. And I say, yeah, but I still want it. Well, we don't have a market transaction because even though I'm willing to buy, I am not able to buy. Very, very important concept. And so here's the idea. So now we are ready to talk about supply and demand now that you understand those concepts. Okay. So here's the thing. Well, let me not erase yet. This dynamic over here, this is the idea behind demand. The idea of demand is the willingness and ability of a buyer to buy something. That's basically what demand is. And supply is basically the willingness and ability of a seller to sell. These are forces and they are affected by a lot of different things, which we'll talk about later and probably on another day. We're going to talk about all the things that affect supply and demand. But in their most basic form, supply and demand are relationships. They are both relationships between price and quantity. Because what you are willing and able to do, when you're willing and able to buy, the thing that tells you whether you are, one of the things that affects whether you're able to buy is the price. And when you're willing and able to buy, you have to be willing and able to buy a certain quantity. You have to, you have to express how much of it it is that you want. As a supplier, as a seller or a business, 
uh, you have to, you're willing and able to sell. Sometimes there are businesses that are not able to sell for certain prices. Some people complain. They say, hey, you're charging $20 for that, but I don't think it's worth $20. I think you should only charge $15. And this is what the business says. I'm not able to sell it for less than $20. $20 is my best price because of all my costs. So if you want to buy it, and if you're able to buy it for $20, then give me the $20 and take it. Uh, because, but if you don't want to pay $20 for it, then that means that you're not willing because you have to be willing and able at a particular price to buy a certain quantity. Okay? And so because, here's the best part, because supply and demand are both relationships between price and quantity, we can graph these ideas of supply and demand on a coordinate plane that has a horizontal axis of quantity and a vertical axis of price. Okay? Now, um, in order to see what that looks like, and we're going to graph them here in just a few minutes, what I now want to do is I want to talk about what's called the law of supply and the law of demand. All right, let's talk about the law of supply and the law of demand. These are very simple concepts. I think they're going to make sense to you. This one's going to make sense to you right away. This one might take a little convincing. Okay? So the law of demand, here's what the law of demand says. You know, if you go to the store and you want to buy, I don't know, let's say a bag of candy, but you want to buy a bunch of bags of candy. I don't know, let's say you'd be willing to buy up to 100 bags of candy. Would you buy more candy if the price was higher or if the price was lower. So if a bag of candy was $3, uh, would you buy uh, versus $1? Let's say that the price of candy can be either $3 or $1, okay? And you have, let's say, $50, okay? You can't buy as many bags of candy if it's $3, correct? When the price is higher, you're going to buy less of it because, you, because you're not able to buy as much as if the, uh, the price was lower. So the higher the price, the less you will buy. And it's not just you, it's everybody. The higher the price of a product, the smaller the quantity that you would be able to buy. Also, the smaller the quantity that you would be willing to buy because you're only willing to part with so much money. Also, if something costs too much money, you might say, you know what, that's out of my budget range. I just can't buy any of those. So there are some people who buy zero because the price is too high. On the other hand, what do we do when, they, when, everything, when things go on sale? If they say, hey, this candy, instead of being $3, it's $1, where it's, it's you know, 67% uh, uh, off. You know, we're selling it for $1 a bag. Now you're going to say, oh, I want to buy a whole bunch of that because, or I'm willing to buy more of it. I can afford to buy three of them instead of just one of them. If I only have $3, instead of buying one bag of candy, I can buy three bags of candy. Well, I was going to spend $3 on candy anyway, so let me go ahead and buy more. And so, here's what the law of demand says. The law of demand says that uh, as the price of a product increases, the quantity desired by, or the, let's say it a different way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a phrase that I wanted to wait to introduce, but I'm going to go ahead and say the quantity demanded, meaning the amount that people are willing to buy, the quantity demanded will decrease. Okay, this indicates a negative relationship, a negative mathematical relationship between price and quantity relationship. Okay, so as price goes up, quantity demanded goes down. And the other way around, as price, if the price went down, If the price went down, then the quantity demanded would go up. So if we were to go over here on this coordinate plane where we have price and quantity on the uh, axes, we could actually draw 
what we call the demand curve. We could draw a picture of the relationship between price and quantity from the point of view of the buyers. That when price is high, quantity is low. That's up here. But when price is low, quantity is high. Well, that's over here. And so in order to get from here to here, as price keeps coming down, quantity will keep going up, and this is what you're going to see. You'll see a downward sloping curve, and we call that, we would put a D next to it. That indicates that this is the demand curve. Now let's talk about the law of supply. Law of supply is almost exactly the opposite, but I'm going to frame it in a different way. The law of supply is based on um, is based on producers' ability and willingness to make stuff. And here's the problem. The more that they make, the more expensive it is for them to make it. So what that means is this. Let's say that there's a company that makes, um, uh, I don't know, makes bicycles. And they can make bicycles. Their cost for making, let's say, 500 bicycles is... Um, uh, I don't know, let's say $30 per bicycle. And so they can produce 500 bicycles for $30 each. But then somebody says to them, well, can you make me 800 bicycles instead of 500 bicycles? And here's the problem, is that if they're already using their, their manufacturing facility uh, to near its maximum capacity, in order to make more bicycles, they're going to have to ask their employees to work longer work overtime, come in on Saturday and work. They might have to uh, build more workstations. They might uh, have to buy, pro uh, buy materials like inputs from a seller that sells it for a higher price. Maybe they're already buying from the cheapest uh, bicycle parts seller. And so now they have to go find another supplier, but that other supplier is charging them a higher rate on each of the parts. And so here's what happens, is that if they want to produce 800 bicycles instead of 500, it's going to cost them more than $30 per bicycle. And because their cost is going up, they have to raise their price on each bicycle. And so what the law of supply says is this, is as the quantity supplied... increases. So the seller is being asked to sell more. The price charged must increase. And what this means is that there is a positive mathematical relationship between price and quantity because of the law of supply. As quantity goes up, the price charged goes up. So over here, if the quantity is lower, the price is lower. That's down here. But if the quantity is higher, the price has to be higher. That's up here. And as we go in between, as the quantity gets a little bit larger, the price gets a little bit larger, and what we would then have is a positive sloping curve, which we call the supply curve. And so what we have just constructed based on the law of demand and the law of supply is uh, what we call here a market graph. This is a market graph. A market graph is a coordinate plane in the first quadrant where Q is on the horizontal axis, P is on the vertical axis, we have a downward sloping curve, which we call the demand curve, and an upward sloping curve, which we call the supply curve. And it's because these two ideas, the forces of supply and demand, are represented as relationships between price and quantity. And, um, and that's, that's it for supply and demand, the basic ideas of supply and demand. And what we're going to do now is we're going to dig deeper into the, these ideas right here, these ideas of quantity supplied and the idea of quantity demanded. Okay. What we're going to do in this particular segment uh, is we're going to now take what we just learned about supply and demand, 
uh, and we learned about the supply curve and the demand curve, and we learned that the supply curve and the demand curve are, a, are each a relationship between the price of a product and the quantity that, that is produced or purchased by either a supplier or a demander, by a seller or a buyer. And so what I've done here is I've uh, created a market graph with a supply curve. As you can see, it is upward sloping because there's a positive relationship between price and quantity in the supply relationship. And in the demand relationship, the law of demand says that there is a negative relationship between price and quantity. And what I'd like to do here is do a few instances you can, uh, where I give you the price of a product and you tell me the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied. And what I'm trying to, what I want you to understand in this particular part of the lesson is I want you to understand what the phrase quantity supplied means and what the phrase quantity demanded means. Because there are a lot of people who um, who mix up the phrase quantity supplied with supply and the phrase quantity demanded with demand. And I'm going to try and explain the difference between these phrases and the phrases supply and demand. Okay? All right, so let's say that the price of a product is uh, uh, $32. Um, I'd like to know, or no, let's not do 32. Let's do 28. Let's say that the price of a product is $28. I would like to know what is the quantity demanded at $28 and what is the quantity supplied at $28. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the $28 and I'm going to move along the horizontal line to the demand curve and I'm going to put a dot there. And what, So this is a coordinate. This coordinate is, has a price of $28. And now we just want to know what the quantity is that goes along with that price. And if we go down here, we can see that the quantity is 35. So we can see that at a price of $28, all the buyers together, all of them, not just, not just one buyer, uh, but all of the buyers together are willing to buy 35 units of whatever this product is in this market. Okay? So... If the price was $28, then the quantity demanded is $35. Okay, well, what about quantity supplied? Well, at a price of $28, we'd have to go all the way over to the supply curve, which is right here. And so there, the price, again, is $28. Okay, well, what is the quantity supplied? How much are the sellers willing to produce and sell? Well, if we go down this line, we're at here, it's... Uh, looks like it's halfway between 77 and 91. These are going up by sevens, so this must be 84 right here. And therefore, the producers, all of the producers, not just one of the producers, all of the producers together, because this curve is representing not just, and this is one of the points of the idea of supply, it's not just one seller who's willing and able to sell, it's all of the sellers grouped together of that thing, whatever this thing is. Let's say that there's 17 different sellers that are all willing and able to sell this thing. Well, together, all 17 of them are willing to produce and sell 84 of them. And so you can see here that at a price of $28, the sellers are willing to make and sell a lot more than the buyers are willing to buy. See, the sellers are saying, hey, that's a great price. We'll make 84 of them for that, and we'll sell them to you at $28 a piece. But the demanders are saying, nah, that's a little too expensive. Only 35 of those of the buyers are, or excuse me, of all the buyers, they are only willing to buy uh, 35 of, these, uh, of this product at a price of $28. Uh, and so the demanders are saying, well, you're going to need to lower the price for us to buy more of them at uh, or more of them um, because $28 is too expensive, okay? All right, let's try another one. What if we were to say, uh, what is the quantity demanded and the quantity... Oh, I did want to point one more thing out, sorry. When we go along the price over here, when we get to this point on the demand curve, we can draw a kind of a dashed line down here and we see the 35. A lot of times what we'll do on the graph is we'll write Q sub D down here indicating that this is the quantity demanded. And then of course if we went over here, 
we could draw a dashed line all the way down to here to 84, and down here we could write Q sub S indicating quantity supplied, okay? All right, so now let's do the same thing for a different price. We're gonna do the same procedure, only now let's say that the price is, uh, let me find a good one here, how about a price of $12? Let's say that the price of the product is $12, um, how much, how, what quantity are the buyers willing to buy, willing and able to buy? Uh, so the buyers, if we go to $12, uh, here's $12, we want to go all the way over to the demand curve here. There's the demand curve, and we'll put a dot right there. And if we were to put a dashed line down here, you would see that 77 is the quantity demanded at a price of $12. So quantity demanded is 77. That's by all the buyers. All of the buyers are willing to, together, are willing to buy 77 units if the price was $12. Now let's look at the quantity supplied. At $12, go over to the, the supply curve. That's right here. And let's go down here, and we'll put a Q sub S. Okay, these are going up by 7, so from here to here, 21, then 28. Okay, so, uh, so the quantity supplied is 28. So even though buyers are willing to buy up to 77, sellers are only willing to set, produce and sell 28 of them. So there's going to be a lot of unhappy people. Well, the reason that they're willing to buy so many of them is because the price is so low. That's $12. That's a pretty low price for this product. But at such a low price, the sellers are saying, we can only afford to produce 28 of them for you. If you were to increase the price, then we could afford to make more of them if you want to. Okay? So you can see that in this particular case, at a price of $12, that the quantity supplied is not equal to the quantity demanded. Okay? So here, let me explain what's happening here. Is the buyers and the sellers do not agree on how much to produce because the the buyers are saying you should make 77 because how, it's how much we want to buy. And the sellers are saying you should only want to buy 28 because that's how many we're willing to produce. So here's what we need. What we need is to identify a quantity and a price where the buyers and the sellers agree. Where the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded. And so what we're looking for, we would like to know where we're looking for a place where quantity supplied is the same as quantity demanded. And at that quantity, when the quantity is the same, then the price is the, is, would be the price that would give them. So whatever price comes from the quantity where quantity supplied and quantity demanded are the same, this is going to be a place of agreement between the buyers and the sellers. Now, I'm not going to go into it right now because I'm going to go into it in a later video, but I wonder if just looking at this graph, if you don't say anything, if you might be able to determine what price would give an equal quantity supplied and an equal quantity demanded. Okay? All right, so here's what I want to get to. Is the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, well, let me leave this up. What I want to point out here is this, is that there's only one thing that has to happen in order for the quantity supplied or quantity demanded to change. Only, well, I don't want to say only. That's not the right way I should be saying it. Let's say um, uh, a change in quantity supplied or quantity demanded requires only a change in price. So we're going to learn about other things that cause not a change in quantity supplied and not a change in demand, but they actually cause a change in the whole system. They cause a change in supply or they cause a change in demand, not just a change in the quantity supplied and demand. 
What I, what I want to point out here is that a change in supply, a quantity supplied and a change in quantity demanded is just simply moving from one of these numbers across the horizontal as, axis. So, for example, I think on the first one we were at a demand of, uh, what were we at? Demand of 35. And then all we did was change the price from 28 down to 12, and quantity demanded went up to 77. Or for quantity supplied. Originally, our quantity supplied was... Uh, uh, 84, and then when the price went down from 28 down to 12, quantity supplied went from 84 all the way down to 28. And the only reason that that quantity supplied and quantity demanded, cha demand demanded changed was because there was a change in price. And it's because these curves represent a relationship between price and quantity. Okay. All right, what we're going to do in this segment is we are going to uh, talk about what in economics is called shifting of the curves, okay? So let's say that I have a coordinate plane. I want to use an analogy here to try and explain something to you. Uh, let's say that I have a coordinate plane, and let's say that the relationship, the two-dimensional relationship here that we're dealing with is we are dealing with um, uh, your paycheck, how much money you get, money, dollars, paid, how much are you going to get paid, and we're going to say this, that the horizontal axis is H, hours worked, okay? So however many hours you work is how much money you get paid, okay? Now, let's say that your uh, rate, your wage is you earn, uh, let's say that you earn $10 uh, per hour, $10 per hour, just to make it easy, okay? Okay, so... Uh, let's say that you earn $10 per hour, and this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 hours, up to 9 hours, and this is how much your paycheck is, right? And so um, you, uh, let's say you were to work uh, one hour, then you would get paid $10, and that's probably halfway here, that's about here. Then you, if you work two hours, that would be $20, so let's try and get that right here, that'll be right about here. And if you were to work three hours, you'd make $30. So that's right about here. And if you were to work four hours, uh, that would be $40. And that would be right about here. And as you can see, it's going to create a straight line. It's is a linear equation. And let me explain why it's going to create I probably got that one in the wrong spot. Let me explain why it's going to create a linear equation. The reason it's going to create a linear equation is because your paycheck... The amount of money you get in your paycheck is going to be equal to 10 times the number of hours you work. And I don't know if you understand that this is actually a linear equation. This takes on the form y equals mx plus b. But instead of x, instead of our horizontal axis being x, it's h. And our slope is 10, right? That's our m. And our b, our y-intercept, is zero. So this would be dollars. How much your paycheck is is equal to 10 times h plus zero dollars. And the reason the y-intercept is zero is because you have to ask yourself how much money would you get paid if you worked zero hours? You would, work, you would get zero dollars, right? So uh, the, the hourly wage formula is a y equals mxb formula, okay? And this is the straight line. This is the linear graph that you would experience as a person who earns $10 per hour. Now, let's say that you got a raise, okay? Now, I want to talk about what that means for a second. What variables are present on this uh, coordinate plane? We have hours and we have paycheck. That's only two variables. We have your, and, and if our formula is paycheck is equal to 10 times h, I want you to notice that really we have three things here. We have this variable, we have the h variable, and then we have the 10. Well, what if the 10 became variable? What if we changed the 10? If we changed the 10, would that just move us from here over to here on the curve? Would it just simply change our location along the curve? 
No, the only way to change your location along the curve is to change either hours or paycheck. And in this case, you would have to change hours because hours is the independent variable. But what if we changed the 10? What if we made the 10 a 20? What if you got a big raise and now you made $20 an hour? What if now your paycheck is equal to 20 times H? Well, now this is what your curve would look like. After working one hour, you would get $20. After working two hours, you would get $40. Let's get this right. After working three hours, you would get $60. It's about here. Okay, and what that's doing is it's creating another linear equation, another straight line. And that straight line is going to look like this. Okay, here's my point. It's that when you change a number that is not the horizontal axis or the vertical axis variable, if you, we're not changing this and we're not changing this. We're changing a third variable or a fourth, fifth, or sixth variable. Mathematically, when you change a variable that is not one of the axes, the result is that the curve itself changes. It becomes a different curve. And what has happened here is that this curve changed in two ways its slope changed and its location changed. It has moved in economics, what we would say is that this curve has moved to the left. And now I'm ready to talk to you about shifts in the supply curve and shifts in the demand curve. See, they only shift left and right. That's the first thing you need to understand is that in economics, we don't talk about supply and demand curves shifting up or down. We might do that in a more advanced class, but in a principles class, we generally only refer to the supply curve and the demand curve shifting left or shifting right. So that's the first thing you have to understand. It, it only either shifts left or right. So let's say that I have a market graph here with quantity on the horizontal axis and price, that's dollars per unit on the vertical axis. Okay, and we've already learned that a supply curve has a positive relationship between price and quantity. And here's what I'm telling you, is that what's going to happen is there are things that affect the force of supply. Let me say it this way. Remember that supply is the willingness and ability of a seller, of a producer to produce and to sell. There are things that can change their ability to produce and things that can change their willingness to produce. One of the things that can change their willingness and their ability to produce is the price that they have to pay for their parts for, or for their labor, the wages that they have to pay their employees. Or let's say that they use steel and the price of steel goes up. Well, this is the price of the product they're selling, not the price of steel. This is not the price of the labor that they're renting. This isn't the price of the people that they're paying. And this isn't the quantity of the, uh, of the steel that they're buying, and it's not the quantity of the labor that they're, that they're paying for. So the price of the steel that they buy to produce their stuff is a completely different variable. It's a third variable that's not on this graph. And because it's a variable not on the graph, because it's a third variable that's not represented here, the way it would be reflected on this market graph is that the supply curve would morph. It would transform into a completely different curve. And that curve could look one of two ways, generally. We're going very basic here. That that change could cause the supply curve to morph into a supply curve that is over here instead, and we're going to call this S prime. Or it could morph 
into a supply curve that is over here. Now note, and we're going to call that S double prime. That's what that little apostrophe means. We call it prime. S prime and S double prime. I want you to notice that the curve still has a positive slope because it's still a supply curve. It's still a positive relationship between price and quantity, but it is now in a new location on the market graph. This happens a lot, I guess you could say. Well, in a microeconomics class, it happens a lot because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test to see if you can understand whether a change in a variable is going to move the supply curve or whether it's going to move the demand curve because the same exact thing can happen with the demand curve. So when the supply curve goes from here over to the right side, we call that a right shift. We call this a right shift of the supply curve. And then when the supply curve starts kind of here, or maybe, but it moves over to the left side of the market graph, we call this a left shift. We would call this a left shift of the supply curve, okay? And so it's important that you understand, uh, and we're going to, next week, I think it is, we're going to go through a bunch of um, scenarios where I give you a situation and you have to know whether that is going to cause the supply curve to shift to the right or shift to the left. Or you have to know whether it's going to affect the demand curve. So let's look at a demand curve real quick. Let's erase the supply curves here. We'll leave the market graph. So on a market graph, we also have a demand curve. And remember that a demand curve is a downward sloping relationship, a negative relationship between price and quantity. Because when the price is lower, people want to buy more. But when the price is higher, people want to buy less, right? Well, what if there's a change in demand? Now, if, there's, if the price goes down, all that's going to change is quantity supply or quantity demanded. That's not going to change the demand curve. The demand curve is going to be the same. But here's a question for you. What happens if the product becomes more popular? If the product becomes more popular and people want to buy more of it, they don't want to buy more because the price went down. They don't care that the, the price could be the same. But if all of a sudden everybody wants to buy it because it's really popular, let's say some famous person wore a particular pair of shoes uh, on TV, and everybody says, man, I want the same shoes that he has. And so they all run to the store to buy the same shoes that he has. Well, that's going to cause, that's a, that's a variable that's not on here. Popularity of a product is not the quantity of the product, and popularity is not the price of the product. That's a third variable. It's a variable that's not represented on this graph. Therefore, it's going to morph the demand curve. The demand curve is going to change into a different relationship between price and quantity. It's still going to be a negative relationship, but it's going to be moved. It's going to appear in a different location on the market graph, and then we would call it D prime. This is referred to as a right shift of the demand curve, a right shift. And the demand curve only shifts to the right or the left, or it stays right where it is. It doesn't shift up and down. On the other hand, let's say that uh, somebody uh, finds out that the shoes are very low quality, uh, that they fall apart after you wear them for about three months. Uh, everybody's going to say, these are terrible shoes. I'm never going to buy these shoes again. And then they put a review online and tell everybody, hey, you shouldn't buy these shoes. They fall apart after three months. Then everybody stops buying it, not because the price went up, but because they, it got a bad review that it's a junky prod, product. So that's going to morph the demand curve into something completely different and move it to another location on the market graph. We're going to call that D double prime. And that would be a leftward shift of the demand curve, a left shift. Okay. And so this idea of left shifts and right shifts of the demand curve and the supply curve are very important concepts. What we call this is a change in demand. A change whoops, in demand. Not a change in quantity demanded. This is a change in demand. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly summarize the difference between 
a, here's what we're going to have, is we're going to have a change in demand. That's one possibility. We could have a change in supply. We could have a change in quantity demanded, and we could have a change in quantity supplied. Okay? Why does the quantity demanded change? It only happens mainly for one reason, because there was a change in price. That's it. This, this, this is the Greek letter delta, capital letter delta, that means change. Because there's a change in demand only because there's a change in price. There's a change in, or sorry, a change in quantity demanded because there's a change in price. There will be a change in quantity supplied only because there's a change in price. Okay? But a change in demand, a morph of the demand curve into something completely new, that's going to happen because of a change in a third variable not shown on the market graph, not shown on the market graph. Same thing for supply. You're going to have, you would only have a change in supply because of a change in a third variable that's not shown on the market graph. And so here's what we're going to do in a couple class sessions, or the next, I think it's in the next class session, is we're going to go over many of the variables that cause a change in demand or cause a change in supply. Okay? All right, we're going to wrap up this uh, session with what we call market equilibrium. We're going to talk about market equilibrium. What is market equilibrium? Well, remember this exercise that we did earlier? Remember how we said that quantity, uh, that price will determine quantity demanded and quantity supplied? And I didn't put the numbers back here, so let's just go with one and one, shall we? So in this case, we say that if the price is one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, let's say the price is seven dollars, then the quantity demanded would be one, two, three, four, five, right? So quantity demanded would be five, but at a price of seven, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, quantity supplied down here, quantity supplied would be twelve. Okay? So let's see five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yep. All right, so and we said that this is a problem because quantity demanded does not agree with quantity supplied. They disagree. And we said earlier, based on the the uh, circular flow diagram that the producer is selling, the firm is selling to the household and how much they're earning in revenue is the same amount that the seller or that the buyer uh, sells for. Well, that's fine. That means that the price is the same and we're good. So that's $7. But here's the problem is that at a price of seven, the seller is willing to sell 12 and the buyer is only willing to buy five. So you know how many are going to be bought? Five. This is what they're going to agree on. But the buyer is now going to say to the seller, hey, if you lower the price, I know you want to sell 12. If you lower the price, I'll buy more. And the seller says, well, if I lower the price, I'll make less, so I won't produce as much. But the buyer says, but that's okay. You can, you'll probably still make more, you know, uh, you know, almost 12. And so the seller says, okay, I'll lower the price. If they lower it too low, like down here to $3, then the seller is only willing to produce four. Let me erase this. So now the producer quantity supplied is only four, but quantity demanded, the buyers are saying, yeah, we really want some of that stuff, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. They're like, yeah, we will buy 11. Quantity demanded is 11. But the seller says, no, I will only make four. So how many will be sold? Four. They can't buy 11 if only four are made. Okay. So the smaller quantity between quantity supplied and quantity demand is always 
the amount that's going to be sold. So let's put that over here. Uh, um, whichever quantity between quantity demanded and quantity and quantity supplied, whichever quantity between quantity demand and quantity supplied is smaller, that's how much, that's how much will be, whoops, that's a P, will be sold slash bought. That's how much will be sold and bought. So here's the deal. There's an idea called market equilibrium where the buyer, the buyers and the sellers sort of negotiate with each other through indicators. Uh, the, 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 if, if the quantity demanded is smaller than the quantity supplied, like right here, the sellers will say, let's lower the price, let's bring the price down to try and sell more. And the demanders will say, well, if we lower the price, then we'll buy more. Or if it's the other way around, the buyers will say they'll bid up the price if quantity demanded is higher than quantity supplied. They'll say, hey, you can charge a higher price and we'll still buy some of this, okay, if you'll produce a little bit more. And so what we find is this, is remember earlier we said that we would like for the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded, the buyers and the sellers want to agree. They want to agree on the price and they also want to agree on the quantity. They want to agree on the amount that they're willing, to, willing and able to produce and agree on what the price is going to be. And so what, here's what we ultimately, I asked you this earlier, but I don't want to answer it at the time and now we're ready to. That we, you should be, and we are looking for this point right here. The point where the, quantity, where the demand curve and the supply curve intersect. That point is the place where the price results in a quantity supplied and a quantity demanded that are equal to each other. So at this price, whatever this price is, quantity supplied and quantity demanded are equal. Equal. See, look at that. Equal. But it's, it's supposed to be A. It's equilibrium. But that's what's going on here. Is at that price and at that quantity, the market is in equilibrium. Neither the buyers nor the sellers want anything to change at that point. When we achieve that, what we have is what is called equilibrium price right there, and we represent it by P sub E, P sub E, and here this would be what's called equilibrium quantity. And equilibrium quantity is where quantity supplied is equal to quantity demanded, and we're going to say that that's now equal to Q sub E, that's equilibrium quantity. Okay, so it's really easy to identify equilibrium price and quantity because all you have to do is identify where the supply curve and the demand curve intersect each other and that automatically, without any other trying, tells you what your price should be and what your quantity should be for equilibrium. Okay, all right, there's only one more thing that I want to talk about. It's related to this idea. Let's go back to the situation. We know that our equilibrium price and quantity, if we're going by one here, if we're going by 1, then we know that the equilibrium price is 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's the equilibrium price, $5. And the equilibrium quantity is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so 8 is the equilibrium quantity. 8 equals Q sub E, and $5 is the equilibrium price. Okay? Now, what would happen in the situation where the price was seven dollars. You're going to want to write this down, this is important. Where the quantity demanded here is a lot smaller than the quantity supplied. 
Well, let's say, let's see, this, this is quantity supplied is 12. This is quantity demanded is 5. So, sellers produce 12. Buyers bought 5. What happens to the other 7? Aren't they just left on the, they're left on the shelf, right? They're not going to, nobody's going to buy them because people only wanted five of them at that price. And what that creates is this. It creates this triangle. See this difference here? This is a difference of seven, right? And this is where they should be. This is where the equilibrium, where the price and the quantity should be. And what this creates here is a triangle on the market graph. And that triangle is called a surplus. It is called a surplus, meaning it's a surplus of how much? A surplus of seven. There are seven more in the market. And so now the, the sellers have to determine what, what are they going to do to be able to sell the other seven, right? Well, in order to sell the other seven, they would have to lower the price. But when they lower the price, they're going to produce less, but people are going to buy more, okay? But we're just going to call it a surplus instead of saying seven. This triangle means that in the market, when this happens, if the price is too high, there will be a surplus in the market. There will be extra stuff not sold in the market. Okay? All right, now let's do, uh, let's do the other situation that we did previously. Let's say that the price was actually $3 down here. If the price is $3, then producers are only going to produce a quantity of four. So quantity supplied is going to be four. But demanders are willing to buy 11. That's quantity demanded. So this difference between the four supplied and the 11 demanded, that, that's a problem here. And that creates this triangle below the equilibrium point and when there's not enough that, that people want to buy, so let's say people want to go to the store and they want to buy 11 of them, but there's only four for sale. Only four people are going to be able to buy it. Seven people are going to do without. This is called a shortage. It's called a shortage in the market. And the solution to a shortage in the market is to increase the price of the product. If there is a shortage in the, in the, in a, in the market, then, then the answer is for both of the sellers and the buyers to agree to increase the price to equilibrium. And just like the solution to a surplus is for the buyers and sellers together to agree to lower the price to the equilibrium price. Okay, write that down. Write down that the solution to a surplus in the market is for the buyers and sellers to agree to lower the price to equilibrium, and the solution to a shortage in the market is for the buyers and sellers to increase their price to the equilibrium price. Okay, and so this whole idea here is called market equilibrium, and when the when the price is out of equilibrium, we we get, a, we get either a surplus or a shortage, and that's not good. That's not efficient. We're going to get to efficiency in two more lessons, uh, but, that's, but this is really important. That's all I have for you in this lesson. I hope you're really coming along with the idea of, uh, of supply and demand, and I think, uh, I think you're going you're gonna to be in really good shape uh, by the end of Unit 2.